Now that I'm used to the climate, a thing that if man ever found, a place to live easy and happy, that Eden is on Puget Sound. Eden is on Puget Sound. That Eden is on Puget Sound. A place to live easy and happy. That Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen, I'm your host. On each episode of this show, I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today in the program is Jeff Nichols. How's it going, Jeff? I am well, Chris. Excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank hey. you. Uh, Jeff is a sketch performer around town. He performs in the group Time Bath. He also does a lot of uh, solo shows. He's about to remount or kind of reimagine one that he did a while ago that set in kind of a post-apocalyptic Old West scenario. Uh, he is also one of the uh, one of the two minds behind the podcast, KEXP, The Beacon in the Waste. KEXZ. KEXZ. Not KEXP. Well, that's something else. Well, yeah. but it's based on that. It's like we okay. find the KEXP studio, and that's where we're broadcasting from, okay. but it's the post-apocalypse. Okay, excellent. So it's, KEX, it's basically KEXP in the post-apocalypse. Right, yeah. Like, we're in Seattle. As oh, ourselves, awesome. but it's the post-apocalypse. Okay, K-E-X-Z, The Beacon in the Waste. The Beacon in the Waste. That's awesome. <laughs> That's a great name. Thanks. Uh, so how long have you lived in the uh, in the Pacific Northwest? Oh, geez. Well, I moved out here uh, for college originally. I'm from okay. Illinois, and then uh, I thought it was about eight years ago, and I've lived in Seattle for four years and just decided to... Stick around, so cool. And you, you went to University of Puget Sound, yeah, that's right? Right, one of those people. Go uh, loggers. delivery boys, loggers. Okay, yeah, cool. Loggers live green. Excellent. Was an actual <laughs> is that was sustainability the motto? motto we had? Oh, nice. It was. Yeah, loggers live green. Uh, that's, yeah, okay. don't think about it too hard. Okay, yeah, I, I won't. Uh, how, so, how much do you know? You've lived here about eight years. How much do you know about local history? Uh, honestly, all I know about local history is either your podcast. Mm-hmm. I did take the underground tour and just picked up a little bit here and there. You know, there's mm-hmm. random signs and. Stuff like that, but really not as much as I'd like to. Okay, cool, excellent. And uh, you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, I correct? have no idea. I'm very excited, awesome. but have not the faintest clue. Sweet. Uh, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, Frederick Warehouser okay. was born in 18... 18- yeah, uh, kind of gives away a lot of the story <laughs> already. Uh, born in 1834 in Niedersalheim, Rhein-Hess, Germany. Uh, one hell of a name. Oh yeah. Uh, one of eleven children, uh, Frederick grew up working on the family vineyard and dropped out of school at age twelve when his father died. Oh yeah. He immigrated to America in 1852 at age 18. He had almost no money and was able to gain employment as a day laborer in Erie, Pennsylvania. Okay. Young German man making it work. Almost, almost just a boy coming over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was in Erie that he married Elizabeth Bladell, and the two moved to Rock Island, Illinois. Hey. Do you know where Rock go. Island is? I, oh, Rock Island. It's not an island. Okay. I think I know that much about it's it. It's one of those... I, I'm pretty sure I've driven past that okay. before. Yeah. One of those non-island island right. towns. There's a lot of strange names in Illinois. Okay. It's random. Uh, there, he worked on railroads, a sawmill, and a lumber yard. Uh, he was a hard worker and became foreman of the lumber yard and sawmill. Uh, he would later say, quote, the secret lay simply in my will to work. <laughs> yeah. He just works his way on up there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, uh, I never watched the clock and never stopped before I had finished what I was working on. I do not relate to this no, person not very no. much. You're a, you're a clock watcher? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I hear you. I think it's, there's a good I'm balance a, between I'm hard work. A, I'm a finger drummer. I'm a nail biter, clock okay. watcher, all those things. Midnight toker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, joker smoker. Uh, he saved his money, and after the panic of 1857, he was able to buy the lumber yard outright. Yeah. So that's something you don't really hear that much of anymore. Like, I worked Mm-mm. this menial job, and I made <laughs> yeah, it I up. bought the McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Don't worry yeah. about that enough. Yeah. I, uh, I, I worked at the... Uh, you know, Urban Outfitters for two years. <laughs> and then I bought the and Urban Outfitters. now outfit. I'm CEO of Urban Outfitters. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he bought the lumber yard outright, and the business went well, and he was able to purchase more sawmills. So just just making more money. Yeah. Uh, he made further investments in pine tracks in Wisconsin and landed Minnesota, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. 
Uh, he was a staunch liberal and believed in workers' rights and treated his employees better than any other captain of industry at the time. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you don't hear that often with captains of industry mm -mm. in the 1800s that mm -hmm. they were treating their employees well. No. And, I don't know, maybe an environmental thing there as well, but... You know, I mean, that's good to hear. Good to hear. Had Weyerhaeuser's taking care of his folks. Yeah. Are you, are you, do you have environmental concerns with Weyerhaeuser? Oh, well, you know. <laughs> with, with, <laughs> considering their business model? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not an expert on the field. I, I assume there's some regrowing and things that happen with yeah. it. Yeah. But for the most part, it's, you know. Reforestation, I know, is a big part of their plan. I remember yeah. when I was a kid, uh, going to camp. And there was somebody there who was telling us about giving us like all of the this hard sell as to why clear cutting was okay. Uh, and the argument was because nature clear cuts. And what do you think mudslides are? And what do you think forest fires are? It's nature clear cutting. You know, there's something there. Because being yeah. from Illinois, mm -hmm. and we've got the prairie there, I we did some like controlled burns and stuff in my environmental science class. So... I see the argument. I don't know. Yeah, There's something viscerally horrifying about <laughs> even when I was a kid. Of dead trees. Yeah, when I was like ten, I was like, "This kind of sounds like bullshit." <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Mm. And I think they actually were warehouser reps, but they gave us little baby trees to yeah. to go home and plant. That's lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, so in 1891, he moved to St. Paul, Minnesota, and became a neighbor and friend of James J. Hill, president of the Great Northern Whale Railway and majority owner of the Northern Pacific. So, okay. lumber tycoon living next to railroad tycoon. Match made in heaven. Yeah, right? <laughs> I want to rub elbows with tycoons. <laughs> and one late night talking, they yeah. just... I, uh, I was recently scouting for a shoot, and uh, do you know Discovery Park, that area yeah, at yeah. all? There's a neighborhood on the north side of Discovery Park, and it's like 12, like... 12 houses that are all probably 10, 15 million dollar houses, but right. they're just out like, just uh, totally. Quite the block party. Oh yeah. man, <laughs> that's, that's where I want to live someday. Yeah, decadence. But that's exactly what I picture, just yeah. rich people rubbing elbows with rich people. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm having pancakes for dinner. <laughs> Uh, so Hill was in possession of millions of acres of land that he had purchased at incredibly discounted rates from the U.S. government for the construction of railroads. Hmm. So they sell him a bunch of land, say, just build railroads on this land, you can get it for almost nothing. Yep. Uh, so guess what he does? Uh, builds a lot of railroads. He builds the railroads, but then he sells the rest of the land to Warehouser. Yeah. So he okay. got, gets highly discounted land, and on January 3rd, 1900, Warehouser purchased 900,000 acres of land in Washington State, along with a few partners from Hill... For six dollars an acre. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Back in those prices. Oh boy, almost fucking nothing. Uh, yeah, it's just like when when you have money, making more money, not not very difficult to do. No, not at all. Yeah, uh, and it's the old saying that making a lot of money is easy if all you care about is making a lot of money. Yeah, but yeah, six dollars an acre. That's I mean, that's not Alaska prices. Where they, <laughs> they got it for three cents an acre. Right. But yeah, so that's, it just seems such, so fucked up. Like, here, US government, take all this land to build a railroad on. Well, I only ra built a railroad on this little sliver, so <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna sell it to a friend of mine for logging. Yep. Uh, the land would be logged and managed by the newly formed Warehouser Timber Company, of which Frederick would be the president. By 1903, the Warehouser Timber Company owned more than 1.5 million acres of land in Washington and had its own sawmill in Everett. Yeah. So, did very well. That's huge. Yeah. But, uh, how old was he when he came across? Like he was 18. 18. He was 18, and he's been yeah. working since he was 12. Uh, yeah, one of 11 kids. So, yeah, he worked his way up very quickly. There was, you know, a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Frederick Weyerhaeuser continued living in St. Paul and left day-to-day -day management of the company to George S. Long, who set up headquarters in Tacoma. He hated publicity, stayed out of the public eye, and loathed the nickname the Timber King that had been given to him by the press. <laughs> I mean, I'd run with it. The Timber King? Yeah, that's yeah. an awesome nickname. I'd make myself a wood crown. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. That's a shame. That's a yeah. Great nickname wasted. And, yeah, and just shun the... Yeah. yeah. Ugh. Uh, when he died in 1913, he left behind a titan of the timber industry to be inherited by his seven children, which his son, John P. Warehouser, would take over as president. Uh, and the crown is... Uh, and, down. Yeah. No, or, yeah. He's so, not the Timber King. He's not the Timber King. His yeah. son is now the Timber King. Yeah. The end. 
No, that's not the answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is just the... And so the, on and so forth. And so the so have ruled Washington. And so it was written, and so it <laughs> shall be. Uh... War, World War I was a boon for the company, and Weyerhaeuser timber was used to build ships, airplane, barracks, and many other military uses. So the government gives the land to a railroad king, he sells it to a timber king, the timber king sells it back to the U.S. government for tons of money. Yep. It's the circle of life. <laughs> Moves us Good all. God. <laughs> uh, by 1920, the company was operating 22 mills and was in control of millions of acres of forest land. Soon after, it, was, it created the Weyerhaeuser Steamship Company. Right. Oh. They're expanding. Did it? Wow. Yeah. Building steamships. They've already They're... conquered land, so yeah. <laughs> the water's next. Yes. Move onward. And then soon, <laughs> wooden rocket ships <laughs> sailing to the stars. Ah, yes. Uh, Frederick had seven children, including John P. Weyerhaeuser. His son, John P. Weyerhaeuser Ch- uh, Jr., had six children, four daughters, and two sons. Uh, so Friday, May 24th, 1935. Okay. Nine-year-old George H. Weyerhaeuser, son of John Weyerhaeuser Jr. and grandson of Frederick Weyerhaeuser, or great-grandson of Frederick Weyerhaeuser, was attending school at Thomas Lowell Elementary School in Tacoma. Oh, yeah. You know that? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know where that is? Well, because, yeah. Yeah, I know that you you went to UPS, so great, excellent. Uh, He left for lunch to meet his sister, Anne, at the Annie Wright Seminary. Yeah. You know where that is, too? Annie Wright School. It's uh, the middle school, I think, is girls only, and then it's uh, co-ed high school. But uh, our school, uh, because I was on the improv team, Mm -hmm. and we performed there. Oh, okay, cool. It was a a pretty awesome gig. Oh, awesome. Very nice. They were were receptive. I mean, it was kind of funny, because it was for the uh, the younger students, so we had to have a clean set Mm -hmm. and college improv, as I'm sure you're aware. Yeah. There was... It was very difficult to self-censor, but yes. we pulled it off. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I could just picture you doing, like, just vile, mm. vile, you know, everybody gets stoned and has sex on the... I, I mean, we were pretty limited yeah. <laughs> in yeah. our topics, so... Yeah, I did a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of shows at schools, and mm-hmm. you gotta kind of pull it back That's just right. a little bit. Well, it's, you know, it's hard to be just thinking off the top of your head, but also, you know, like, what's so... Yeah. Yeah. I like the little kids, though. All they want to do is see you, like, play an animal and fall down. Yeah. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> what? Super fun. Why didn't we think of that? <sighs> Uh, it was common for the children to meet there at the Annie Wright Seminary, seminary mm-hmm. and take the family chauffeur would pick them up and take them home for lunch. Remember, they're super, super oh, wealthy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a super ritzy neighborhood. Oh, still. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, George had been released earlier than usual for lunch and was about 15 minutes earlier than expected, and he opted not to wait, but instead to make the short walk home by himself. He took a shortcut through a path that went along the Tacoma Lawn Tennis Club. You know Which, where that is? Oh, it's still, still there. Still there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this neighborhood apparently has not changed much since Not much. Honestly, I think 1935, a lot of these, maybe not a lot of the houses, but at least some of them were probably standing. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. got a pretty clear mental image. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, paint a picture for us. What's... Oh, green. Okay, uh, great. The, and, yeah, the lawn tennis is it's fenced in, but it's like an ivy-covered fence. You can't really see into it, and it's... um. Uh, there's like a split in the road that it's exists in between in and lots of trees and hills. It's a very pretty neighborhood. Cool. Yeah. Uh, upon exiting the path, he arrived at Burrow Road where he saw two men sitting in a green 1927 Buick sedan. They called out to the boy and asked him directions to Stadium Way. As George started to give them directions, they jumped out of the car, grabbed him, threw him in the back seat, put a blanket over him and drove off. Yeah. I, yeah. d- for a second, I, I did see that coming. Yeah. That's, that's scary. Not good when, you, with, with a story like this, when you start to get into very specific dates, it's like, oh, yeah, shit, I, that was, that was ominous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the family became concerned when George didn't arrive home for lunch and didn't return to school either. They contacted the Tacoma Police Department to report his absence. At 6.25 p.m., a postal carrier brought a special delivery letter to the Weyerhaeuser home. It demanded $200,000 for the boy's return, and the back was signed by George to prove they had him. So, yep. high-profile high, uh, kidnapping oh, yeah. here. Uh, the ransom note had 21 points of action for them to take, telling them they expected payment within five days. When they had raised the money to put an ad in the Seattle PI, to, to, when they had raised the money to put an ad in the Seattle PI personals column that read, "We are ready," and to sign it, Percy Minnie. So when you're when you're ready, you because it, uh, the it's signal. yeah, you can uh, you can communicate then through the newspaper personals Without, instead of like call us at this number, and then they could easily find out where you are. Elaborate scheme. Yeah. 
Uh, upon the time the ad was placed, the family would receive word on where and when to make the payment. The letter was signed, Egoist. Huh. Which is an odd sign-off. Yeah. That's... Not not the coolest, uh, like, yeah, criminal... That they're political... De plume. St- I don't even yeah, know it. I'm not sure. Rational decision-making. Yeah, exactly. interest The logician yeah. to committing this crime. Right. Yeah. Uh, this was a few years after the Lindbergh kidnapping in 1932, yeah. when Charles Lindbergh's 20-month-old son had been kidnapped and killed. Right. And the parallels were ominous. And the family was distraught. Um, after the Lindbergh kidnapping, new statutes had been put in place, and the penalty for kidnapping was far more severe than it had been in the years prior. Good. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's a shame like that a... something horrible has to happen in order to create new yeah. laws around it, but yeah. It's just a decade of kidnappings. Yeah, it really a is. A lot of those. Yeah, it's really, uh, I think before that people viewed it as like, oh, you kidnap, you pay him the money, then you hunt them afterwards and everything's fine. But once this, you know, infant was killed, they said, right. okay, well, we need to re-examine how we, how we approach this. Oh, man, I am nervous. Yeah. I, I gotta tell you, You're... very apprehensive right now. Okay, uh, so the FBI came in to investigate, and more than a dozen agents were put on the case. The $200,000 was put together, and agents worked on, worked on noting the serial numbers of all 20,000 bills. The numbers were then sent to Washington, D.C., and compiled onto a 10-page list that would be sent to banks, post offices, and other locations where large amounts of money are passed through once the money had been exchanged and George was home safe and sound. Mm-hmm. So they got the serial numbers of all 20,000 bills. It they... is tedious but important work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, I can't imagine how many people that would take to... I mean, they have a dozen agents, but I'm sure they had to have more than that to write down the serial yeah, numbers of the... every... And you also have to put them... In order, so that you can have, uh, yeah, so you can have uh, it referenceable. Yeah. So not you don't find a bill and then have to go through twenty thousand <laughs> oh, random no. numbers. <laughs> yep. Uh, Saturday twenty fifth. Or Saturday, May 25th, 1935, the warehousers put two ads in the Seattle PI classifieds. The first, quote, expect to be ready come Monday, answer Percy Mini. The second, due to publicity beyond our control, please indicate another method of reaching you. Hurry, relieve anguish mother, Percy Mini. And the family received no responses to these. So they didn't give, send out the just, we are ready. They're trying to communicate, you know, we're, we're working as best as we can, but they're not getting anything back. Yeah. Tuesday, May 28th, John Warehouser put another PI ad in the red, uh, uh, another ad in the PI that read, We Are Ready, Percy Mini. Mm -hmm. So he gives them exactly what they told him to do. Uh, The press had not been notified as to what was going on, and law enforcement agreed not to intervene until the boy was returned for fear of endangering him further. Mm -hmm. Which is. I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know enough about how to handle kidnappings to know if that's a good decision or... Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like I don't really have many leads yeah. in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they're such high-profile people. Any, it could be anybody. This isn't going to be, like, some friend of the family that's, you yeah. know... Uh, Wednesday, May 29th, 1935, John Warehouser got a letter instructing him to drive to Seattle and check himself into the Ambassador Hotel at 806 Union Street under the name James Paul Jones at exactly 7 o'clock. Along with the instructions was a letter from George saying he was safe. Okay. And I know the kid's still okay. That's good. And they're they're trying they're just saying check yourself in under the pseudonym and we'll contact I'm, you there. I'm feeling optimistic so now. So things are going okay. Things are the wheels are turning. Wheels yeah. are turning. Uh, at 9.45 that night, a taxi driver delivered a letter to him at the hotel with instructions to drive to South Renton Avenue and 62nd Avenue in Rainier Valley with the money. He was to look for a white cloth tied to a stake on the right side of the road. Uh, he did as he was told, and upon finding the stake with the cloth, he found a tin can at its base with instructions to drive another 700 feet to another white cloth and park. The world's worst scavenger hunt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Ugh. Yeah. This would be fun if it wasn't for such horrible, horrible... Yeah. Right. Um, so, drive another 700 feet to another white cloth and park, leaving his parking lights on and the engine running. So, John did as he was told and sat there in the car idling for three hours. Probably the longest and worst three hours of his life. Yep. Uh, no one approached him, and there was no evidence that he had missed something or neglected any instructions. Well past midnight, he returned to the Ambassador Hotel in Seattle to await further instructions. 
So he's thinking maybe they just wanted to see that I would do. Maybe they were just checking it out. Maybe they're somewhere else scoping out knowing that I'm here. Mm. But he's just freaking out. Yeah. Because there's, yeah, he's uh, he's in this hotel. No clue what's going on. Just waiting yeah. to make sure that his son is okay. Ugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, 11.30 a.m. the next day, Thursday, May 30th, he received a phone call demanding to know why he didn't follow the instructions in the second oh, note. Oh, come on! Yeah. Ugh, that is frustrating. That's real bad. Either they're really bad at this, or this is some next-level mind games, but... Oh, you think it might be my... Oh, I haven't oh, thought about that. I mean, I don't know, but... Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But this is just, you know, he's just getting blown around. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, because I, I, I always just assumed that he had not seen the note or missed it somehow but if, oh. you, if they're like fucking with him that yeah. like there is a note that, god but if he had missed it well i mean either way it's just like they're trying to like drag him out and make him so tired and freaked out that yeah oh I boy mean, that's that's a lot but if he did miss it then that's like incredibly frustrating too yeah like, ah, it was right there Oof. yeah uh, he said he never found a second note. The voice on the other end of the line told him he would be given new instructions, and if they were not followed to the letter, he would never see his son again. Oof. Yeah. Uh, at 11.30 p.m., he got a call from the hotel from a man with a fake European accent telling him to drive to 1105 East Madison Street. It was so bad that he immediately knew it was a fake accent. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was he could clearly tell this is not an actual European person. Okay, 11th and Madison. Uh, so... Yeah, right where Chop Suey is Great. today, right, yeah. right by there. Um, and look for a tin can that had more instructions. And this is, Capitol Hill is not the right. the dense spot it is today. This yeah. is kind of the suburbs at this point. There's so. not, it hasn't been just lots of cigarettes and joints right. butts thrown yeah. into the tin can by the time he finds it. It hasn't been immediately collected by someone and put into a cart. And then, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, right. yeah. Uh, the tin can note told him to drive to the halfway house on Highway 99 near Angle Lake. Then turn onto a side road. Uh, Angle Lake is down kind of by... You know where Angle Lake yeah. is. Yeah, it's down hey, by... The train stops there now. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, down by uh, the, the airport. Yeah. Um, so drive to Angle Lake, then turn onto a side road. There were more notes, each with additional instructions on where to go and get the next set of instructions. The final note told him to park the car, leave the $200,000 in the front seat, leave the engine running, the dome light on, and the driver's door open. Then get out and walk towards the highway. Oh, boy. So tell me, just leave the car. Yeah. Which is... Mm. Just, I mean, like, I understand the need for caution in these layers and layers of instructions, but they're making it really hard to get the money. Like, yeah. He wants to give them this $200,000 so badly. Yeah. And just... And they're putting all these barriers, yeah. I know. Yeah, but they're freaking out, too, because right. they could, you know... If anything happens, they could be executed if the kid, yeah. if something happens to the yeah. kid, or at the very least sentenced to long jail, prison sentences. This is a high stakes yeah. game. Uh, so he did as he was told. He left the car running with the parking brake on, dome light on, leaves the car, leaves the door open, starts walking towards the highway. Uh, after getting about a hundred feet from the car, he heard someone running out from the bushes, get into the car, shut the door, and drive away. Okay. So the car's gone, money's gone, kidnappers are gone. He got back to the highway where he was picked up and taken back in to his home in Tacoma to await further instructions. Okay. So now they have the money, but he has no idea if oh. they're going to actually honor their word, Balls if they're going to leave court. the kid. Uh, so, uh, Sunday, Saturday, June 1st, 1935, at 3.30 a.m., the kidnappers dropped off George Warehouser... <laughs> on Issaquah, Issaquah Hobart Road, four miles south of Issaquah. Uh, they left him with two di- dirty blankets and a $1 bill. Oh, boy. He was told to wait there in the rain, and his father would be to buy to pick him up later. So he is dropped off safe and sound, but he's in the middle of nowhere by himself, nine years old. Yep. Uh, instead of waiting, he began walking down the road until he came across Louis B. Bonifa's farm, knocked on the door, and told them who he was. At which point they likely said, holy fucking right, shit. Right, because this is, has it been in the paper at this it's point? It's leaked it's... a little bit at this point, yeah. yeah. Um, Mrs. Benefus made him breakfast, and they got him some clean, dry clothes. Then Mr. Benefus loaded him up in their Model T Ford and drove him down to Tacoma. I'm so glad this story has a Model T Ford in it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, driving from Issaquah to Tacoma on, I'm sure, bumpy roads. Yeah, I mean, it's already really inconveniently far away from anything. Yeah, like, and especially, yeah. Is, yeah, there's no I-5 at this point either, right? so yeah. it's just Bumps. dirty back roads. Yeah. 20 miles an hour the yeah. whole way. Mm-hmm. Uh, they stopped at the gas station to call the warehouser home, but there was no answer. Oh, great. Which is surprising and strange that there would be no answer when they're sitting there waiting for instructions. Yeah. Uh, they then called the Tacoma Police Department and informed them George was safe and on his way back to Tacoma. So they called the cops. We got the boy. He's okay. Great. And maybe in the back of their minds, they're thinking, I hope they don't think we kidnapped him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Seattle Times sports writer John H. Dreyer was in Tacoma covering the kidnapping, which had made its way to the press at this point. Mm. And he received a tip that the boy had been released near Issaquah. He was able to intercept beneath his car on Pack Highway and convince him he was a police officer and gave the farmer $5 for his trouble and took custody of George. Okay. So this new- That's a power play. Fucking A it is! <laughs> yeah! So the kid had been kidnapped. He's in safe hands. This this nice farmer is taking him home. And then a newspaper reporter who wants the story intercepts, grabs him, says, I'll take the kid, makes him sound like he's a cop. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know John Dreyer, but fuck John Dreyer. Yeah, that's some that's f- opportunism. Yeah. Right there. That's yeah some, it's pretty that's, gross. That's some shady yellow journalism shit. Yeah. I yeah. mean, don't get me wrong, I'm a staunch supporter of the free press, but... Yeah. Mm. But this is not free press. This is <laughs> no. uh, this is kidnapping press. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he took custody of George. He then put George in the back seat of the car, took back roads to avoid the police, and interview him getting an exclusive. Oh. So he has him, like, in the back seat of the car, like, ducking Dodging down. Cops du- while interviewing him. Yeah. Uh, that's... Yeah. At uh, 7.45 a.m., the car arrived at the warehouser residence, and George was home safe and sound. Dreyer went to the Hotel Winthrop and wrote his exclusive story, which was then sent to the Associated Press and became a national story. Because, of course, everybody wants to know what's going on. Yeah. But he's still kind of a douchebag. Poor kid. Yeah, that seriously. So traumatizing. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awful thing to happen. Yeah. Um... Let's see here. Uh, Law enforcement had held back while George was still in the custody of kidnappers, but now that he was home safe, they launched, as they put it, quote, the greatest manhunt in the history of the Northwest. Um, Oh, well, in the history of the Northwest. Yeah. Maybe not in the history of of America, but, yeah, uh, yeah, in the history of the Northwest. Okay. So they're like, let's get these fuckers. They they kidnapped this kid. Um, The FBI released the serial numbers they had taken from the ransom bills. Yep. Of course. John Warehouser's 1933 black Pontiac sedan with the black ransom bag and tin cans was found in Seattle's International District. So they drove from Angolite to the International District, ditched the car, and got the hell out of there. Yeah. June 2nd, a Union Pacific station in Huntington, Oregon, reported a $20 bill with a serial number matching the ransom money was used to purchase a train ticket to Salt Lake City. See, this is why now in movies, the kidnappers always ask for non-consecutive bills. Yeah. So this is before that was in the Oh, that's true. Zeitgeist, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Because, like, I would have, you know, not that I would ever engage in kidnapping, right. but that's but like, did. kidnapping 101... Yeah. Or any kind of ransom. I hadn't thing. thought about that. That They do say that in movies. Yeah. Yeah. In non-consecutive bills. Yeah. This is exactly why. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, they, they didn't see those movies Mm-mm. yet. The talkies hadn't come out yet. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, you know, it's good that they hadn't because... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's call it work. Uh, by June seventh, twenty uh, ransom bills were found to have been used at various stores in Salt Lake in the Salt Lake City area. SLC police officers went undercover at cashiers' cages in Salt Lake City stores. So they're like, we hope we'll just station ourselves here and hope somebody comes in using one of these dollars and we'll get them. Mm-hmm. Uh, June eighth. One week after George had been returned, Mrs. Margaret Von Metz was arrested for trying to spend a $5 bill with the serial number matching the ransom money. Okay. One week they made it. Uh, Shortly thereafter, a man with the name Metz tattooed on the back of his hand was arrested and brought into the FBI for questioning. They were identified as 24-year-old Harmon Metz Whaley, an ex-con, and his new 19-year-old wife, Margaret Eldora Thulin. Wow, I am older than them and have never done anything remotely close to as ambitious as this. <laughs> that's your takeaway. <laughs> I mean, twenty-four. That's yeah, that's yeah. Young. You gotta, uh, gotta have that drive if you wanna. Yeah. Good God. Well, you said you were a clock watcher, right? <laughs> yeah. A finger drummer. That's true. Uh, 
I would say that's good that you haven't been ambitious no, in this yeah. particular way. <laughs> if that's yeah, what it translates to. But. Yeah. So they got him in Salt Lake City. They got him in Salt Lake City. Yeah, they got pretty far. You got to yeah, admit. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a week within a week yeah, of them getting true. caught though. So. Uh, more ransom money was found in Harmon's pocket, and upon investigating the home they had started renting in Salt Lake City three days ago, they found another $3,700 in ransom money. Yeah, that's probably them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and also, who has tattoos on your hands in 1935? Of, and is that of his name or it's of her? his name. Oh, yeah. His name. He's yeah. got his own name He's tattooed. got his own name tattooed on the back of his hands. <laughs> Which, again... Try denying that it's you with that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Never heard of... Ah, well, you got me. <laughs> yeah, uh, identifying marks. And... Yeah, really. Mm-hmm. Another thing that you would learn if you watched more movies. And Yeah, I you don't see anyone with their own name tattooed on their hand. No, not anymore. Not in no, movies. Maybe it, was a, maybe it was a popular step in 1935, <laughs> but... Uh, after some ter- interrogation, Harmon Whaley admitted to his role in the warehouser kidnapping. Five years prior, he was serving six months in an Idaho prison... When he met William Daynard, who was serving 20 years for bank robbery. Mm. Uh, Margaret had read an article about the warehousers, and it gave them the idea to kidnap one of the children for ransom. So they said, these guys are rich. Let's kidnap one of the kids. Yeah. Ugh. Disgusting people. Yep. They're not really given the argument to, you know, more efficient parole boards. Very much stuck. Right? Yeah. Also, the guy that was sentenced to 20 years for uh, bank robbery, he was paroled pretty early. Yeah. He did oh, not okay. serve much of that sentence. I think yeah. his first time he was up for parole, he got it. Yeah. Uh, they have been tracking the boy's movement for days, trying to figure out the best time to make their move, and suddenly saw him emerge unaccompanied in front of them and grabbed him and threw him in the car. They were looking for the opportunity to kidnap him, and then it just, they just see him walk out in front of them. Uh, Harmit and Margaret gave signed confessions of their part of the crime to the FBI. They also told them they had buried their portion of the money and where to find it. June 10th, the FBI dug up a gunny sack with $90,700 in it. Uh, Harmon Whaley pled guilty and was sentenced to 45 years in prison. He served at McNeil Island before ultimately being transferred to Alcatraz. Alcatraz. Yeah. Because yeah. oh, it's the boy. 1930s. Yep. And that's where they send high profile. It's the big league. Ooh, yeah. 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 You don't want to go to Alcatraz. Mm-mm. Unless it's now, in which case it's a fun afternoon. I but uh, I didn't go to Alcatraz when I was in San Francisco. No. I missed that one. No. Uh, the first time I went to San Francisco, when I was uh, when I was a kid, we went to Alcatraz, and there was a former Alcatraz prisoner there who had just written a book about his time at Alcatraz, oh boy. who was signing copies of the book, and uh, I got it, and I've read it. I've read it a couple of times since then, and it is amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It's a surreal experience. Yeah, he was a uh, he was not violent, but he was a, he was a bank robber. Mm. Um, and he just escaped from every prison that they put him into. Right. So he escaped from prison like five times and they just said, okay, well, you're going to Alcatraz. And he tried to escape from Alcatraz, but yeah, yeah not difficult to, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you don't want to go to Alcatraz. No, no, Alcatraz. No. Yeah. Bad, bad End place. End of the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ultimately was released in 1963 after serving 28 years. Wow. And to suddenly emerge in the 60s. That's, oh, yeah. That's gotta be. The 60s in San Francisco, <laughs> too. <laughs> oh, uh, he had expressed deep regret for his actions, and the Warehouser Corporation hired him at one of their Oregon plants. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? I'm sorry. Just... Oh. Oh man, just to what it would take to do that kind of forgiveness. What an for... awkward job interview. Yeah, right. Anything we should know about your past. And your coworkers like, oh, I went to forestry school. Oh, I was a, I was a logger at another company for twenty years. I kidnapped the son of the head of the company. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, but they gave him they gave him a job, and he worked yeah. at one of the Oregon plants. There you after go. He got released. Uh, Margaret Whaley tried to plead guilty, but her lawyer advised against it. She was assigned former Seattle Mayor John Francis Dorr as her trial lawyer, uh, and she was convicted and sentenced to 20 years for kidnapping and 20 years for conspiracy to be served. guilty. Yeah, well, they were served concurrently. Okay. So it's maybe not longer. I don't know what the plea bargain would have been if she pled Fair guilty. Enough. Uh, she was released in 1948 and moved to Salt Lake City, where she remained and lived until 1989. She just really wanted to live in Salt Lake she City. She did, yeah. <laughs> that's really... You, you, so, Margaret, you could have cut out the whole kidnapping <laughs> thing yeah. and just gone to Salt Lake City. Yeah. Drainard got word that his accomplice has been picked up and drove to Montana to lay low. He was spotted in Butte by a cop who had arrested him years earlier for bank robbing, but didn't know he had been implicated in the warehouser kidnapping. 
Mm. He just said, I've got you for bank robbery. Get out of my town. He went back to the town where the cops <laughs> would recognize him. Oh, boy. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of all the places to go to. Yeah. That's not a good idea. Mm-mm. These people are not Maybe very Maybe someplace smart. you've never been before. Yeah. yeah. Go somewhere you don't... Somewhere tropical. Well, I'm sure I won't get caught for bank robbing this time around. Yeah. What are the odds? Being arrested for the same thing, same city twice. Yeah. That's really dumb. Yep. Yeah. Well, I didn't rob a bank this time, so I'll go to the place where the cops know me and know oh, I'm not to be He's trusted. a bank robber, not a kidnapper. Yeah. Those are two very different skill sets. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, two officers saw him and tried to apprehend him a few days later, but he escaped by climbing over a fence and fleeing down an alleyway. He left behind a suitcase with $15,155 in ransom money. Um, after nearly a year on the run, William Daynard was arrested in San Francisco after trying to pass bills where the serial numbers had been altered. <laughs> I'm trying to like, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was operating under the name Bert E. Cole. He was arrested and found to have thirty-seven thousand three hundred and seventy-four dollars in ransom money in his possession. Can't, yeah. It's probably, Prob- yeah. probably yeah. the guy. Yep. Yeah. But no, it says his name is Bert E. Cole. Yeah, it must be a coincidence. I don't know mm. where all these bills came from. Uh, he pled guilty and was sentenced to 60 years in prison. He Oof. served time in the McNeil Island for a time before ultimately being transferred to Alcatraz. Alcatraz. Yeah. Oh, boy. Real bad guy. Yeah. Uh, Daynard's accomplice, Edward Fliss, was also arrested in San Francisco and pled guilty to helping him launder money. Uh, John Warehouser gave Louis Benefus a lifetime guaranteed employment at the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Mill. All right. Yeah. Which, uh, I, I find the guaranteed employment thing interesting, because what if he was just a real shitty employee? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, he's just saved... got a soft spot for you. Yeah. yeah. But he saved his son, so, yeah. or, you know, was, right, helped him out. Like, was the, the one character to actually do the right thing. Yeah! He, yeah. he kind of is the only person in this to, to be, you know, a sympathetic, and he and his wife were yeah. just good old, good old folks, good yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, George Warehouser went on to attend Yale University. He oh. joined the family business first as a logger, then a foreman, and took over full control of the Warehouser Corporation as CEO in 1966. Cool. Um, he also served as director of Boeing, Chevron, and Safeco. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> just just to get all your bases covered. Yeah, a very yeah. Northwest guy. Wow. Uh, he retired in 1999 and is still alive and well today. Oh. Yeah. That's... Good to hear. Yeah, so, I was, it was I was pretty worried there. You thought he might, it. yeah, die. Yeah, lying, so. I didn't want to say it. But, yeah, no, yeah. he's 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 still still alive and kicking as of this recording. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, if if you're out there, George, I <laughs> hope you're doing well. If you're listening, and I know you're probably a big podcast fan, <laughs> then we wish you the best. Yeah. Uh, the Warehouser Company is currently worth $8.4 billion. Oh, and, my God. Yeah, and recently moved its headquarters from a large campus in Federal Way to Pioneer Square. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard that, about that. That big new building yeah. down in Occidental Park is the new Warehouser building. Yeah, well, they are, uh, so, um, the, uh, the, the psychology building, which was built at University of Puget Sound, which was, uh, my first three years, we were in, like, a really old hall where the mm-hmm. pipes would bang and oh, know, yeah. the lights would flicker. It yeah. was just a terrible place to do psychology. But the new building was Wirehauser and it was, so it's Wirehauser Hall. Oh, right? okay. It's nice. Wirehauser Money did that one. That's and a gorgeous campus down there. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> they water the lawns all the time, <laughs> even when it's raining. Nice. Yeah. Nice. But they also have a commitment to sustainability. Yeah. So, yeah. Loggers, loggers live green. Loggers live green. Yeah, I spent a lot of time down there. Uh, I was really active in speech and debate in high school, yeah. and so they have a big debate tournament there. Cool. Yeah. I didn't do debate, but I did a forensics, which I don't know if you oh, know what that is. Yeah, it's the same kind of umbrella. Speech I also thing. did forensics. Cool. With it. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yep. <laughs> We're super cool. Well, that was a great story. It had all the great elements. It had people with suitcases of money jumping over fences. Yeah. You know, it had all the old-timey mystery. Yeah. Things, so old private was, schools. And, yeah. Yeah. And, you, just, and, you can't write stories that bizarre mystery. Yeah. You know. The Timber King crown was passed down <laughs> once again. Yep. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for listening to the Seattle Files. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. I, that was that was lovely. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Really appreciate it. Uh, like us on Facebook. Subscribe and rate in iTunes. If you have a topic suggestion you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. And to support the Seattle Files, go to patreon.com slash theseattlefiles. Thank you for listening. We'll be back new, next Tuesday with a new episode. 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 Next Tuesday with a new episode.